My name is John Samuel Pickwick. I'll be 27 next spring. Only my grandmother and my wife call me Johnny. My father, Robert, used to do the same when he was alive. I don't know why I'm John, but Samuel was my grandfather's name. My parents were born on the same day. By a strange coincidence, they died on the same day, 22 years apart. My mother, Evelyn, was 22 when she died. Since I was only a few months old at the time, I don't remember anything about her. No one ever talked about her. My father died on a deserted stretch of highway. His car went off the road and hit a tree. He was under the influence of alcohol, but not drunk. They think he may have fallen asleep, as there were no skid marks. They have never been able to determine exactly why he ended up on that highway. My dad and grandparents raised me at my grandmother's house until I was eight. When dad finally saved up enough money, he bought his own house, and that's where I've lived ever since. A house is in a typical suburban setting, one of those developments where every third house is a repeat. Dad died four years ago when I was in college. He had a troubled soul. Dad wasn't inclined to say I love you, but he always tracked me down and gave me a big hug when he got home from work. I can't remember a day when he didn't smell like whiskey. However, we never had a single bottle of liquor in the house. Even though he spent a lot of time at his favorite pub, I really don't think he had a drinking problem. His pictures still hang on the walls of the pub throughout the years, when he was the darts champion, dad drove a truck and knew just about everyone in town. When he was sick, his neighbors came to him with soup and elixirs. Dad didn't believe in pain medication, so witch's brews, as he called them, were the only remedy he took for his ailments. I wasn't so lucky. If I got sick or felt pain, he would take me to the doctor to get a shot in the ass. I learned not to complain. Dad loved playing rugby, and so did I. No matter how rough the rugby was, if I complained about an injury, he teased me, saying, let me know what size dress I need to buy you, Joan. I don't ever remember us having a party. Dad was a loner and had a very narrow circle of friends. It was unusual for him to date the same woman a second time. Attempts to get him a date proved fruitless. When Dad died, Grandma paid for a beautiful headstone, Robert Pickwick, Evelyn Pickwick, the loving parents of John Samuel Pickwick. I had never been to my mom's grave until after my dad was buried. I have a degree in civil engineering. I work for the city on road improvement projects. I really didn't set out to work on roads but was inspired by a few presentations when I was a sophomore in college. I interned with the city between my junior and senior years. The timing was perfect, as one of the old-timers was retiring around the time I graduated. I married my high school sweetheart, Mary Ann, and we have a four-month-old son, whom we named Robert Samuel. Mary Ann and I kept up throughout middle school. I blew it by being with a girl who let everyone sleep with her. You know how high school kids are, afraid of dying virgins. There were a lot of tears. Since I was going to college and Mary Ann wasn't, we just broke up. We would say hi when we ran into each other, during vacations, after graduation, I moved home, and about a week later, I found Marion on my front porch. I still wanted to see if we had any magic left. We began the slow process of reconciliation. I learned that Marion had her own house in town. Her father had accepted a job a few hours away, and her parents moved shortly after Marion graduated from high school. Marion worked as a bookkeeper at a clothing store downtown. After a few dates, it became abundantly clear that there was definitely good chemistry between us. She wasn't a virgin, and I had found myself on the floor more than once in college. We never talked about the details, it was in the past. Our courtship lasted less than six months before I proposed to her. We waited a few years before we decided to have a child. Marion labored for up to 10 days before giving birth. I'm a typical 6 foot, 200 pound out of shape guy. Marion is petite, about 5 feet tall and barely 100 pounds her breasts look like little pancakes with raisins on top. Marion is athletically built, and being so light, she twists when she rides me like a horsewoman, I've never experienced that before, and I loved it. She's a tigress in the bedroom and doesn't deny me anything. 
It's not about what you have, it's about how you use it. One of her favorite role plays is when I sneak up on her in the kitchen and pin her to the table. I mask my voice with a low growl while tormenting her. I can't call this a rape fantasy, it's more like a rag doll, a submissive slave. This little treat was delayed when Marion became pregnant. As her due date approached, she began to look like a water balloon with legs. She hated her appearance and couldn't understand how I could love her when she was so bloated. There was nothing I could say to assuage her fears, as she was tormented by hormones. My engineering degree didn't prepare me for how to calm her fragile thinking. Robert Samuel wrapped his little fingers around me, and I would do anything for him. Marion really enjoys being a mother. We've already planned an addition to the family as soon as Robert's first birthday comes around. I earn enough at my job to easily afford our lifestyle. Marion is very self-conscious about her figure. She wishes she had bigger breasts. Since she's breastfeeding, they're too big now. There's a guy who lives next door who seems to hang around our house. Charlie just graduated from high school and does hard work when he can find it. He always asks if we have any tasks he could do. I find him a little creepy, he's a very big guy. About a week before Christmas, our marriage took a big hit. When I got home, I found Marion sitting on the couch, crying. I'm so sorry, Johnny. I didn't mean for this to happen. I'm so sorry, Johnny. Mary Ann, what are you sorry about? Tell me what happened. Sobbing, she spoke. I was unloading groceries, and one of the bags ripped. Charlie was next to me and started helping me pack, even though I told him I could finish it myself. He carried a few bags into the kitchen. When I turned my back to him, he pressed me against the counter. He did the same thing you do when we play this game. I think he was peeking at us. I was just locked in. I was scared and confused, but I couldn't speak. He put me face down on the kitchen table, and I. Was it rape? I'm sorry I didn't say anything. No, I didn't finish. It happened so fast. I was scared. You didn't answer me. Was it rape? Marion didn't answer. She shook her head negatively. That's just great, Marianne. No, it wasn't like that at all. I didn't know what to do. I just froze. What about screaming and kicking and scratching? Johnny, it was a mistake. I should have done all those things. I love you. Please don't hate me. How long did you have fun? Johnny, it wasn't fun at all. I was numb. Robert started crying, so I burst out, pushed Charlie, and locked myself in the bathroom. I've showered probably ten times since then. I wish our marriage wasn't a crying marriage. Maybe you could have saved it. I'm going to stay at my grandmother's for a few days. Johnny, no, don't go. I need you. I want to be your wife. Please don't go. I love you, please. Her tears and her pleading won't stop me. I felt like punching my fist into a wall. It was the scariest thing I'd ever seen in my life. At rugby practice, I told my buddies what was bothering me. Lots of clapping on my back and trying to cheer me up, but I was in pain. A few days later, when we were warming up before a game, one of the guys took me aside. John, Charlie fell down. And what is this world coming to? He got kicked while he was down. I think a couple of guys kicked him about a hundred times with steel-toed boots. He's in St. Rose. There may never be any little Charlies. You guys are the best. After the game, I went home. Marion started crying and begging again. I am so sorry. I made a mistake. I love you. Please don't leave me. Please don't. I'm not ready to discuss it. I took a shotgun shell casing, wrote Charlie on it, and stuffed it in my pocket. I found Charlie's hospital room. During the attack, he had tried to protect his jewelry with both hands. His hands were no match for the steel toes of rugby players' boots. 
Both hands were in casts, and he had a lot of tubes connected to him. When he saw me, his blood pressure began to rise, matching his growing fear. I showed him a shotgun shell casing. Charlie, I'm not going to hurt you today. You see your name on this casing? If I ever find out you even thought about Marion, your mouth will be full of what's in that little thing. Am I making myself clear enough for you? Charlie nodded affirmatively several times. His blood pressure was alarming as I left the room. I walked into the pub to drown a few sorrows. Grandma scolded me when I arrived at her place. Johnny, open your heart. Give her a chance. Don't wait too long, please. I'll need a few more days, Grandma. I hugged her and went to bed. In the morning, I found Grandma at the kitchen table with a box of tissues. She had taken down the picture of my father and was staring at it. It didn't look like she'd slept through the night. Are you okay, Grandma? The holidays are hard. Have you thought about what I said? Yeah, I'm not ready yet. I'll see you tonight. I repeated last night, headed to the pub, listened to a lecture. When I got to Grandma's house, I went to bed. I woke up on Christmas Eve and found Grandma in the kitchen again. She looked upset. The tissue box was empty, and she was looking at a picture of my father. I thought she was mumbling something, but I couldn't make out what. Good morning, Grandma. Anything in town? It's my day off at noon today. Johnny, have you made up your mind yet? Not yet. Open your heart, Johnny. It was a mistake, maybe a big one, but a mistake nonetheless. Do you need me to tell you about some of the big mistakes you've made? How is this different from you and that S at school? I just hope you don't wait too long. You're just as stubborn as your father. Grandma, we're married now. That's different. Marion was already wearing your wedding ring at the time. I'll tell you what's different. It's now you have to deal with the sting of betrayal. When it was her feelings, no big deal. But now that it's your feelings, well, that's different. Don't wait too long, Johnny. She cried again. I kissed her forehead and left. I found myself in the pub around supper time. Not much here, a few people coming and going. I was feeling very depressed. God, I miss Marion and little Robert so much. I think I had already decided what to do. Another sip of pride, I washed it down with whiskey. I know liquor isn't the answer, but I was pretty sure milk and water weren't either. Hey kid, a voice said. He held out his hand. You look the way I feel. My name is Bobby. I've been watching you for a while now, may I join you? I looked up and saw a guy about my age, maybe a little younger, with blank eyes and an impassive stare. I could smell a slight whiskey odor on his breath. Sure, I said, shaking his hand. I didn't see you. My name is John. Let me guess, he said. Like me, cheating wife? I nodded. People live here, Johnny. Christmas should be spent with family. That's right. I'm John, but I never knew my mom. She died when I was a baby, and my dad died four years ago. What about you, Bobby? Well, if you're John, I'll be Robert. I have both my parents alive, I'm alive until I figure out how to raise a child, Johnny. I found out about this a month ago. You? I'm John. Last week, my lady took a little s at a party and got laid. Anyway, she felt guilty and broke down a few days later. You? My neighbor forced himself on her, but she didn't stop him. That night, she couldn't take it. Let me guess. I'm sorry, it was a mistake, I love you, don't leave me. Yeah, all of it. I guess there's a script they all follow. I'm telling you, Johnny, I was cruel. I made her tell me every last detail. She was grief-stricken, but I didn't back down. I told her I'd probably get a divorce. I hear you. I haven't filed yet, but I'm crazy to think I will. 
I should have calmed down, but I couldn't chew and swallow the last bit of pride. That's what hurts the most. I'm telling you, Johnny, she had eyes full of tears. She worked here as a waitress, and guys hit on her all the time. I still carry a picture of her. He slipped his hand into his back pocket and pulled out his wallet. He knew exactly where the picture was. It was wrinkled, but you could tell she was a beauty. The picture was taken a couple of years ago. It's still my favorite. You never got back together with her? No, I was too stubborn. She made a mistake, and I would have forgiven her, it just took too long. She wrote me a note and left. All I have to remember about her is our child. He opened his wallet again, rummaged through it, and pulled out a picture of a woman with a baby in her arms. I can't believe she left you with a baby. We were all shocked. She loved him so much, it didn't make any sense. I can't bring myself to hold the boy, he reminds me of her. Robert, that's why you have to hold him, because he reminds you of her. He opened his wallet again, rummaged through it, and pulled out an envelope, folded in half. He unfolded it carefully. On the cover was written, in a woman's handwriting, Bobby. He carefully extracted the letter and pushed it toward me. She had written in very elegant handwriting, Bobby, I'm so sorry. I will never forgive myself for this. I can't live without you. Love, Evie. His eyes clouded over, and mine did too. You could see the heartbreak on his face. Do you ever talk to her? I've tried. My mom helps me with the baby. Jonah, like you, he'll never know his mom. Plus, the boy meant the world to her. Yep. Don't you think you have a chance of getting back together? He slipped his hand into his coat pocket and pulled out a photograph. He flashed it in front of me, it was a picture of a tombstone. She lives here now. It was her suicide note. She went to her grave thinking I didn't love her. I come in here every day, drink a little whiskey for courage, then walk down the deserted path to talk to her before I go home. His voice hadn't changed, the life had already been pumped out of his soul. I, on the other hand, had never felt worse. My stomach cramped, my eyes clouded with tears, and my heart had never been in so much pain. He wiped his eyes and carefully put everything away. I felt so sorry for him. He's about my age and has to live with this for the rest of his life and raise his child. So, you have to ask yourself, Johnny, would you rather hold your wife or look at her name engraved in stone? I know which one I choose, I just don't have a choice anymore. Merry Christmas, Johnny. Thanks for letting me bother you. He turned and headed for the door. Merry Christmas to you too, Robert. Maybe I'll see you again. He didn't even look back, he just raised his hand and waved. I tried to swallow the last sip of whiskey, but the lump in my throat prevented, tears streamed down my face, and I called for the waitress as I started to put on my coat. She was young, and I hadn't seen her before. Holding out a $20 bill to her, I said, is that enough? Let me get your change, honey. No, keep the change. Merry Christmas. Oh, thanks, honey. Merry Christmas to you too. She bent down and picked something up off the floor. You must have dropped this. It was a picture of a tombstone. No, the guy I was talking to must have dropped it. Honey, you're wrong. I've been here since 4 o'clock, and there've only been a few people here. You've been alone all night. No, it was a guy my age. His name is Robert. She touched my cheek and looked into my eyes. Be strong, Johnny. You can do this. It's time for you to go home. She motioned the picture toward me. I looked at the picture and trembled. My head was spinning, my vision blurred. I looked again to make sure. Evie Pickwick, the loving mother of John Samuel Pickwick. I rested my head on the table, everything swirling around me. This couldn't be true. I took a deep breath and stood up. I looked again, and instead of a picture in my hand, I saw a drink coaster. 
My $20 was lying on the table. I looked around and didn't see the waitress. I took my $20 to the bar. I tried to pay the waitress back. She could keep the change. Well, man, I sent her home an hour ago. Let me get you your change. Let the waitress keep it. Merry Christmas. I was dizzy all night. When I got to the car, I called home, but there was no answer. I dialed Mary Ann's number, but no one answered. I don't remember much about the ride home other than chanting, please be okay, please be okay. My son will not be raised the way I was. I pulled into the driveway and found the house dark. I called Mary Ann's parents. Hi, Mom, it's me, John. Is Mary Ann there? She's busy. She's putting Robert to bed. Could I ask her to call you tomorrow? I'd really like to talk to her tonight. She's busy tonight. She's with people who love her. Can you just leave her alone tonight? Please tell her that all is forgiven, and I want her back if she agrees. I'm home. The phone went silent. I walked into the house and headed straight for the bedroom closet. I pulled out a shoebox full of dad's stuff. I sat down in the living room, opened the shoebox, and found his wallet. I carefully pulled out the two pictures and the letter he had shown me earlier. The photos were a little yellowed. I found the third photo. All three of them. I gasped with sobs. I kissed the pictures. I love you, mom. I love you, dad. Another glance in my wallet, and I was holding a picture of Evie's tombstone. I trembled, trying to calm myself down. Marianne's parents lived two hours away. I didn't know if she'd come home tonight or if she'd even come back at all. I was a wreck. I counted the chimes from 1 to 11, and when the 12th chime struck, I heard the front door open. Marianne had put the stroller in. She was crying. Johnny, it's me. I raised my hand as a stop sign. I know it was a mistake. I get it, it's over. We'll never talk about this again. I've never loved anyone as much as I love you. I want you back if you'll take me. She threw herself into my arms. I love you, Johnny. Never again, I promise. We hugged and kissed for a long time. What's that on the table? It's my father's things. I was very lonely today. I'll clean it up in the morning. Merry Christmas, Johnny. I don't have anything for you. Merry Christmas. Having you back was the only thing I ever wanted. I'm so sorry. I'll never forgive myself. I can't live without you, she whispered. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I squeezed her tight, and my tears came again. Marianne, it took me a few days to realize it, but I'd rather live with you than without you. The energy and passion we put into our lovemaking were incomparable to anything we had ever done. I don't think we fell asleep until 4 a.m. Robert's crying woke us up around 6 a.m. Oh, come on, get dressed. We need to get to Grandma's house. Grandma was sitting in the kitchen with a box of tissues. When she saw us, her eyes lit up like a five-year-old seeing presents under the tree. She hugged Marianne and kissed her forehead several times. Marianne didn't know what to think. Grandma really needed this. Johnny, you made my Christmas, she said. I'm sorry I made you cry, Grandma. Grandma rested her head on my chest and hugged me tightly. Later that morning, Marianne stood in the kitchen, holding Robert in her arms and rocking him like mothers do. Grandma took a picture of my father, and I helped her hang it back on the wall. When did you stop calling Daddy Bobby? I asked. Her head turned sharply toward me, a strange look of surprise mixed with shock on her face. The first Christmas Eve after Evie died. He'd come home and announced he was going to be Robert, and she was going to be Evelyn. Bobby and Evie had been too painful for him. That was the weirdest thing. He also took you out of the crib. Up until that point, it was like he was afraid to hold you. You slept in his arms all night from that night on. He hugged you every chance he got. 
Are you all right, Johnny? You look a little pale. I twisted with a cramp as a shiver gripped me. A little strength. I'll be fine. Johnny, Bobby would be so proud of you. It may not have mattered much to me yesterday morning, but it did today. Marianne and I got home at dusk. While she put Robert to bed, I started putting away my father's things. I looked at the pictures again and began to shake as my tears flowed. It was her. She was the waitress. Epilogue, Charlie has disappeared. I no longer chase Marianne around the kitchen. Robert has a younger sister, Evelyn. By one of life's little oddities, she was born on the same day as her brother, two years apart. I paid for a new headstone, Robert Bobby Pickwick Evelyn Evie Pickwick together forever, the loving parents of John Samuel Pickwick. I've tried to explain to Mary and what happened that night, but she doesn't believe me. I warned you, Johnny, not to drink on an empty stomach. I can't explain it. I know that every time I find myself in a difficult situation, I touch my cheek where she touched me and think of her words, be strong, Johnny. You can do it. And he also had a lot of tubes connected. When he saw me, his blood pressure began to rise, matching his growing fear. I showed him the shotgun shell casing. Charlie, I'm not going to hurt you today. You see your name on this casing? If I ever find out you even thought about Marion, your mouth will be full of what's in that little thing. Am I making myself clear enough for you, Charlie? He nodded affirmatively several times, his blood pressure was alarming. As I left the room, I walked into the pub to drown a few sorrows. Grandma scolded me when I arrived at her place. Johnny, open your heart. Give her a chance. Don't wait too long, please. I'll need a few more days, Grandma. I hugged her and went to bed. In the morning, I found Grandma at the kitchen table with a box of tissues. She took down the picture of my father and stared at it. It didn't look like she'd slept through the night. Are you okay, Grandma? The holidays are hard. Have you thought about?